behalf of AAU, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome you all to this exciting webinar, uh, is Impact UNH Sierra webinar on deepening support for refugees student. You may be aware or you may recall while we were in Abidjan, we made a presentation on our upcoming initiatives and partnerships. And one of the partnerships we highlighted was the UNHCR initiative in supporting refugee students through the S Impact uh, program. So we are excited to be hosting this exciting informative session, which has been lined up and we have our agenda as projected on the screen. But before we go into the agenda, I would like to express our gratitude to the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, the staff who are connected and those that have been behind the scenes to work with the World Bank and AAU uh, as we arranged this platform for exploring the potential partnerships. The objectives of the webinar will be sharing insights in the distinctive capacity needs of refugee students. There will be opportunities to explore collaborative opportunities with UNHCR, and we'll also have to learn from some of our direct experiences, ACEs that have hosted uh, refugees students. So we have two ACEs uh, selected uh, to share their experiences as indicated on the agenda. So let's take a quick look on our agenda. We'll have opening remarks uh, from the World Bank, and this will be given by uh, Dr. Namrata, the project task team lead. And then we'll have a presentation giving us an overview of what we are exploring with the UNHC, uh, UNHCR, and it will be done by the UNHCR team. And then we'll have two centers, as mentioned before, SEFTA and then MSCAT from Nigeria, from Niger, and the two center leaders will be sharing their experiences as they have already been uh, carrying out some of these capacity building trainings at their centers uh, since 2015. And then we'll have opportunities to ask questions and uh, that will be an interactive uh, session. So just a reminder, we have interpretation available you may choose the language of preference. The webinar will be carried out both in English and French. The speakers will be uh, speaking English and French. And your engagement is very vital. We are looking forward to your, uh, your, your suggestions. So in case you have any suggestion or question, uh, we invite you to post your questions on the chat. And at the end of the webinar, uh, we'll pick up all the questions and also, if you would like to speak, you'll be given an opportunity uh, to unmute and speak. So thank you once again for joining us. And we are excited to share the knowledge and exchange and also have discussions uh, with the UNH, UNH, uh, UNA, UNHCR. So at this point, I would like to give the opportunity to uh, uh, Dr. Namrata our project task team lead uh, to give us uh, opening remarks from the World Bank. So over to you, Namrata. Hello, thank you, Sylvia. Um, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everybody connected from different locations. Um, our center leaders, deputy center leaders, everybody who's connected from our centers maybe. Um, confused about why Sylvia is introducing me as uh, the task team leader. But if you recall, um, I was at the uh, Abhijan workshop and I uh, have started co-leading the ACE Impact Project uh, with uh, EQUA. So very happy to be connected here and very, very happy to see um, so many of our centers uh, connected to today's webinar. A warm welcome to everybody from uh, the World Bank side. Um, so Sylvia has very articulately shared uh, the purpose of uh, today's session, 
We have also seen from the informational emails that were sent out what the focus of today's uh, session is going to be, um, specifically focusing on how uh, our centers can engage with, continue to support, begin supporting uh, refugee students. And uh, all the credit, of course, for sharing this information and for taking us in this direction, organizing the workshop goes to our uh, friends at the UNHCR who are uh, connected with us today. So thank you, Frank, Priscilla, and uh, everybody from UNHCR who's here. Um, so, so colleagues, I think, you know, from our side, uh, the reason we wanted sort of to organize this session is firstly, some of our centers, maybe several of our centers are already doing many things to support refugee students in the region. In Western Central Africa alone, maybe Frank and Priscilla will correct these numbers, but I think there are over a million refugees. Um, a smaller percentage of these would be looking for higher education services. And as part of our ACE Impact Project, when we're looking to improve higher education equitably within the region, serving refugee students in the best way that we can is imperative. And so this session is really for us to link with the experts, that is UNHCR, to understand what is it that refugee uh, students are looking for, how best can we support them, and also for UNHCR to learn from centers that are already providing these services about how they are doing, what they are doing, and what are some of the challenges that they're experiencing? What are some of the innovative things that are working well? So uh, so I'll, I'll basically close here with a request that please make this session interactive. Do participate uh, actively. We're all eager to hear uh, from you and from our UNHCR colleagues. Uh, so wish everyone a productive session and uh, over to, back to Sylvia and over to our UNHCR colleagues. Thank you again for joining. Thank you very much, Namrata. And at this point, I would like to pass over the floor to our colleagues from UNHCR. And uh, you have the floor for the presentation and any few remarks that you may have before you begin the presentation. So over to you, Frank. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Thank you, Namrata. Thank you to colleagues from the AAU and from the World Bank. Um, and mostly thank you to, to everybody from the Centers of Excellence who could join us here today. Uh, uh, I think we have a really good number on this call. So really delighted to have the chance to make this connection um, to share a little bit about the work that UNHCR has been doing, uh, but also all of our partners have been doing in this field of, of higher education for refugees. Um, we're gonna use uh, the f initial 20 minutes that we have to, to talk a little bit about um, some of the, the kind of the global picture when it comes to higher education for refugees, some of the key protection concerns and barriers which refugees face in accessing universities. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, how we're seeing universities engage in this issue of, of refugee inclusion in, in higher education. Uh, we'll share an example of best practice uh, where we've seen a, a university really uh, take the lead when it comes to enrolling refugees, but also more broadly looking at re issues re around refugee education. And then we'll talk about some other different ways that we're engaging with university partners uh, on this issue of refugee access and inclusion in higher education. But before we start, maybe I'll just um, say, I'll just ask Priscilla if that's okay. If, uh, there's four of us from UNHCR on the call today. Um, and we have two colleagues, Arash and Alana, who will be part of the presentation and who will uh, introduce themselves in a little bit. But maybe Priscilla, if I can ask you to come off mute and just say hi quickly, because Priscilla is our education lead in West Africa. And so she is a key focal point for uh, this discussion and any future discussions. Hi, Frankie. Hi, everyone. I hope you can see me or at least hear me. Um, very nice to. Can you hear me, Frankie? Okay. Um, 
Yes, thank you, Frankie. I just arrived at the Regional Bureau for West Central Africa this week, and I'll be coordinating the education response in the region. I'm very happy to see the good turnout today. Uh, very looking forward to find some solutions for refugees for higher education. Enrollment is a big challenge, um, and access to higher institution an even greater challenge. So happy to see the interest and to work together. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, so with that, I think we'll dive into our presentation. And uh, the key here is is the word that Namrata uses interaction. We don't just want to be talking. Uh, we will try and give you a little bit of information to start off with, but we really want to hear about some of the inclusive practices that, that universities are taking in the region. Um, and can I ask you all, just for our interest, it would be great if you could introduce yourselves in the chat. Uh, let us know uh, your name, the institution you're working for, um, but also, um, you know, just maybe say a word or two if any of you are working with refugee populations already, not just on enrollment and higher education, but on any other issues to do with forced displacement. It would be great to hear about that, just so we have a, a, a bit of a picture. Um, so refugee higher education, uh, 15 by 30. This is our the framework in which we operate. Um, as UNHCR and partners. So uh, what is 15 by 30? So this is a global target agreed uh, in 2019 um, under the, the auspices or, or, or under the, 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 um, the framework set up by the UNHCR alongside the, the government of Germany, uh, who hosted a conference in 2019 with, with universities, with global partners, with donors, with states, um, on how to increase uh, global enrollment in refugee higher education. At that point in 2019, the global enrollment rate was at 1%, and you can see that figure there in the slide, uh, and we're now at 7%. So we've seen a lot of um, progress during those intervening uh, four or five years, uh, but I think we have to, to, to sound a note of caution there. Firstly, through looking at the, the global um, enrollment rate of students in higher education, which is at 42%. And secondly, by saying that 7% enrollment is not evenly spread. And I think certainly when it comes to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we see still enrollment rates are very low. So in West Africa, I believe the enrollment rate of refugees in higher education is still at around 1%. Uh, in the Eastern Horn of Africa, it's around 2%. So there's a huge disparities in, the, in these numbers who are enrolled. And so we really need to think about when it comes to reaching that target of trying to get 15% of refugees enrolled in higher education by 2030. Um, how do we ensure that we have a focus not just on regions where rates of um, enrollment in higher education are already very low, uh, sorry, very high, but also in those regions where they're very low. And that presents multiple challenges. And I think the, the, the countries in which the centers of excellence work really speak to those challenges. You know, we see um, in those countries, not just very low rates of enrollment in tertiary education, but also very low rates of enrollment in secondary education and primary education for refugees. For example, in Niger, the rate of enrollment in, in secondary education for refugees is still at 1%. And so we need to think holistically about the whole pipeline uh, of students coming through uh, the continuum of education in order to feed that uh, that pipeline into tertiary. And also to say, just looking at the figure on the top left, why it's important to, to focus on countries which are hosting large numbers of refugees. And it's because the figure there, 75%, so three quarters of refugees are hosted in lower middle income countries. And those countries are most often uh, the countries neighboring those that the refugees have fled from initially. So this is where the vast majority of refugees are hosted and it's where the, there is the most overwhelming need. And so that's where when it comes to achieving 15%, we really need to maintain a strong focus uh, on those countries which host these large populations. Uh, next slide, please, Alan. So uh, in terms of the barriers which refugees face in accessing higher education, um, I don't want to, to, to pause here too much or to, to, to focus on this too much because I think these are barriers that maybe you'll be already very familiar with. Um, some of them are, you know, like 
similar challenges to, to challenges faced by other low and middle income groups, but also refugees may face additional challenges uh, in terms of accessing universities. And these additional challenges that refugees face may be related to documentation. Uh, if they've left the country um, which they have fled, they may have you know, like not brought their academic documents with them. Uh, they may not be able to transfer credit. Uh, also, refugee um, populations are most often hosted in border regions, sometimes in camps uh, where it's very hard to, to get out in or out of the camp, um, or it's very far, it's on a border region far from a university town or city, so it makes access very hard. And then also we may see in many countries, although this it doesn't seem to be the case in West Africa, that refugees pay uh, international fees to access university. Um, so this makes university unaffordable for refugees. And so these, these challenges, which are specific to refugees, are also compounded by additional challenges, which, you know, like many students from low or income or marginalized groups face in terms of accessing university, um, related to cost, uh, related to kind of lack of access to connectivity or electricity, um, related to the lack of, of the number of higher education institutions. Um, and then there may be compounding or intercepting challenges um, related to gender or um, people with disabilities, uh, which refugees face, which equally makes um, accessing universities um, a, real, a real challenge. Next slide, please, Alana. And so how does UNHCR operate within these these barriers or to, to overcome these barriers. So we work um, in over 50 countries on higher education projects, many of them in West Africa, trying to support um, higher education in five ways. One, the first one is through national enrollment. So this is enrollment of refugees into national universities. Here, we work in many different ways. Sometimes it's through providing those universities with training and protection and um, guidance on how to enroll refugees or um, guidance in terms of, um, you know, like the, 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 the admissions procedure um, or in terms of outreach, uh, any kind of, you know, like assistance which UNHCR can provide to allow universities to access refugee populations is, is what we're doing there. And that's similar with the next one, which is TVET, Technical Vocational and Educational Training. The third way we try to provide support is through setting up what we call third country pathways. So this is education pathways. So where a refugee may have fled to a country of first asylum, um, they, we then work with universities in third countries and often these will be in Europe or North America, but not always. Uh, we have third country pathways in um, within the African continent, also to, to Mexico and various other places. So this is where a unit, where a, a refugee will get a scholarship um, to be able to access or to continue their studies in that third country. We also work through what we call connected higher education. So connected refers to what other UN agencies may call digital or distance learning. So this is particularly um, relevant in refugee hosting countries because of the barriers I mentioned around movement or cost. Um, or, um, or, or these kind of um, bureaucratic uh, barriers which prevent refugees from accessing universities. So we work with many partners in many countries um, to try to bring higher education to the refugees where they're hosted. So for example, and I'll bring up an example of this in a minute. Um, in Kenya, we work with a consortium of universities called Borderless Higher Education for Refugees who set up a learning center within a camp. And in that learning center, they provide certificate, diploma, um, degree level and master's level courses uh, to refugee populations in Dadaab. And uh, many thanks to those of you who are writing your introductions in the, in the comments. And just a reminder for everyone, please do put your name down there and just say if you are working with, with any refugee groups in whatever capacity. And then the last, uh, strand that we have for achieving 15 by 30 years is our global scholarship program, uh, the DAFI program, um, which has been running for over 30 years now and provides bachelor's level scholarships to refugees. Um, and it's a full board scholarship. 
Uh, and we'll come on to talk about this in terms of the type of support that refugees need to be able to access university. It's not just about tuition, but there's a whole host of other support costs needed to ensure that refugees not only access university, but also are able to thrive there. Um, so that's um, that's been running for 30 years. And then so to come on now and talk about a case study, we thought this might be interesting for, for the ACE centers, although I'm sure, um, well, we're really looking forward to hearing from, from you all around the case studies that, that you have from your own centers. But this is just a, excuse me, a university that we work with that we wanted to share some of the the best practice that they do to to give you some ideas as to 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 how or an institution might work uh, to enroll refugees. So this is Kepler College, um, which is based in Rwanda. So Kepler College, over the past seven or eight years, I believe, have been running a refugee higher education program, and so far they've en enrolled and um, and seen complete uh, eleven hundred refugee students. Um, they have a main campus, which is in Kigali, the capital city of Rwanda, but they also have a satellite campus based in Kaziba, which is the refugee camp in Rwanda. Um, and through through that modality, they're able to provide higher education, both on site and within the camp. And this speaks to that barrier we we're talking about around refugees not being able to have access to mobility or transportation or whatever it might be uh, to be able to attend university every day. Uh, so they've come up with a solution to that with a satellite campus in a camp. Uh, not to say that's the only model, but it's been a successful model in their in 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 their case. Uh, they have a, a bridging program they call Iteme, uh, which I believe means to bridge in Kenya Rwanda. Uh, so the bridging program is not just academic; uh, it's a bridging program which focuses on the social aspects of learning. And I think this is a really critical point to to, to emphasize. Um, that refugees often come to, to higher education with a whole host of uh, psychosocial needs, emotional needs, um, lack of uh, social well-being. Um, and so a bridging program or a support program needs to try and cater for that to ensure refugees are able to succeed. And the bridging program also caters uh, to the work needs of the students, you know, like with work readiness training, these kind of things. Um, the, the model that, that Kepler have, I think a lot of their refugee places are scholarship places funded by donors, but they also have a cost sharing model uh, with the refugees, which is based on a repayment over several years of the, of the tuition fees, um, based on the refugees get uh, achieving a certain job at a certain um, income threshold so that they're able to make those repayments. And the reason the students are willing to do that is because of the next statistic, which is that over 90% of the, the students, the refugee students from Kepler uh, are employed within six months. Um, they have a very strong um, track, which allows their graduates to get into employment. They co-design their, their courses with uh, the private sector. Um, I should say here that Rwanda is a bit of a special case because there are very few restrictions on the right to work for refugees in Rwanda as there might be in, in many other countries. Uh, and so it makes that pathway to employment uh, more straightforward. Uh, but it's not to say that other similar tracks couldn't be employed in different contexts. Uh, they also provide their refugee students, uh, they set up what they call study and labor mobility pathways. So this is looking for work or for um, study in a third country which refugees can access through a specific visa. Um, and so Kepler prepares students for those opportunities that give them the right kind of information and preparation so that they're able to take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, they also, Kepler works with secondary schools. I mentioned the pipeline uh, and the lack of refugees coming through secondary schools. In our experience, it's critical that the higher education institutions do work with secondary schools uh, to inspire the refugees to, to maintain their studies, to finish secondary, to get their school leaving certificate, um, to ensure that, um, that, that, that that pipeline is strengthened and maintained so that we do have secondary school leavers coming through secondary and into tertiary. Um, they provide the, the support to academic and administrative staff to deal with refugee issues. And I think the final point is critical that, that all of this is based on a co-design methodology with the refugees. So they design their support services and, and their kind of um, protection program with the, with the refugees. 
Um, so having it as a as a kind of student led approach. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so we'll just end the next one. So we'll just talk here. This is my final slide, and then I think I'm handing over to Arash um, about how we as as UNHCRs are engaging with higher education institutions. And I think there's there's a number of ways in which we're doing this. Um, so um, we in the, the field of connected higher education, which I which I mentioned, we work with a consortium, which we're the co-leader of, of over 40 universities who operate in this field of, of post-secondary connected learning for refugees, looking at how we can provide digital learning opportunities to refugees in the places where they're hosted and how to ensure that those lead to, to decent work and to livelihood opportunities. Um, but what we really need to focus on in that work, I think, you know, like a when we reflect on it ourselves, uh, we have to be honest and say that the vast majority of universities we're working with are based in Europe and North America. So if you look at our, our delivery models, it's often based on, a, for example, a, a Canadian university delivering in a camp in um, Uganda, for example. Uh, we've been less good at engaging with national universities, especially on the African continent, to deliver these kind of digital learning opportunities um, and so that's really a key area of focus for us. And so in terms of how um, your institution may want to get engaged, we do have a workshop we'll be delivering later this year, um, which has been put together by the universities we work with um, on how to develop digital learning op opportunities for refugees. So going through all of the, the kind of um, aspects of it from academic support, social support, learning pathway design, uh pedagogical approach not to say that it's a blueprint but just to share the experience of of those who've been operating in this field for many years um, and to build that kind of community of practice between universities who are offering digital learning for refugees um, and we're also the second point here we're trying to build up a, a repository of courses that can be available um, for refugee learners so what UNHCR is trying to do and to fundraise for is to ensure that refugee learners in the locations where they're based can have access to connectivity, um, devices, um, social support, these kind of things. And then so the universities can kind of plug in on top of that. So we're trying to see our role as providing that on the ground support and facilitation, which is often very challenging for universities to do. Um, and it provides a kind of foundation that universities can plug into. So. For example, if your university wanted to deliver in um, in Malawi, in Zaleka, you know, UNHCR would have set up the, the right kind of on the ground support to allow that to happen. Um, and the third thing we'd be eager to engage around connected higher education with, with universities in, in the ASON would just be on joint advocacy to learn from what you're doing, um, to share that with, with, the, with global networks, um, to, to to really build what I mentioned before, this community of practice um, amongst higher education institutions. So that's it from me, and I'll hand over to my colleague Arash. But before I do that, I just realized I had failed to introduce myself when I started. So, <laughs> so belatedly, I, I will say I'm uh, Frankie. I work with, uh, with the UNHR at our education headquarters in Copenhagen focusing on, on digital learning and higher education. And I'll hand over to my colleague, Arash, who's uh, working alongside me in, in the higher education team. So Arash, over to you. Thanks a lot, Frankie. Hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be in the call with you all now. Um, as Frankie mentioned, I'm Arash Bordbar. I work with the uh, UNHCR education section in Copenhagen focusing mostly on campaigning partnership, student engagement, and community capacity building. We've heard on um, some of the challenges and maybe the bigger picture when it comes into refugee higher education. And as Frank mentioned, there are different ways that um, we coordinate and try to stay connected with a lot of our partners. So as you can see in this specific slide, um, there are different partners that we work with member states, we work with ministries, private sectors, we work with academics, 
um, the UN agencies and, and others. At the center of this, um, we have the Global Tertiary Education Task Team, which basically helps us to coordinate with um, different task team or different thematic areas under the 15 by 30. Actually, there is another pillar which I haven't added yet. It's um, the Global Academic Interdisciplinary Network or GAIN. Um, that we are going to work with very soon um, that focuses on academic engagement, research, um, and post-graduation. So just to give you a little bit of information um, and ways that you can engage with us and stay up to date is that uh, the Global Tertiary Education Task Team, which was established in the lead up to the first Global Refugee Forum in 2019, to basically coordinate and promote engagement um, with refugee higher education and to mobilize more support. And the mission is basically to support more refugees achieve sustainable future and self-reliance by developing dif different skills and earning qualification that Frankie was mentioning. The TASTEM is kind of like the global coordination and information sharing structure, um, supporting partners that are engaged with the 15 by 30. And the task team mission really includes about advocating um, for conducive policy environment, fostering strategic partnership, developing evidence uh, and research, and mobilizing resources to help us cultivate sustainable and inclusive higher education um, opportunities. We can share more about it. For example, we have, I think Frankie mentioned the CLCC Connected Learning Crisis Consortium, but we also have task team that are focused on complementary pathways, which um, basically is about um, finding opportunities in third country so country uh, rather than the country of asylum where refugees are based through a uh, master degree qualification and et cetera. Um, the other pieces that also we work with, which is worth mentioning is the tertiary refugee student network or other bodies um, that are really around engagement of students or engagement of local actors um, and refugees themselves in helping us achieve 15 by 30. Tivet Group is the other one um, that we are focusing quite um, a lot as well. And that's really with some of the um, bigger institution um, like the GIZ and ILO, uh, International Labor Organization around finding pathways for um, refugees into labor mobility, labor pathways as well. Next slide, please. Great, so we've talked a lot about different um, ways of engagement and a little bit about the 15 by 30. So what is missing? How do we get to the 15 by 30? We're at 7% now and there's a long way to get there. Um, and we wanted to find out how we are able to actually give visibility um, and connect some of the other partners that are involved in, um, but they haven't been able to really get um, showcase their work. So each one take one um, is something that we're going to launch soon, um, which is the way that we will collectively deliver on the global target um, to achieve the enrollment of 15% of refugees by 2030. The 15 by 30 objective um, that we put, this will help us to recognize the many stakeholders involved in and committed to expanding access to higher education. It really tries to um, amplify the role that different education um, institutions and centers like yours can and should play in addressing the emergency and the development challenges that refugees um, would have. So basically, it helps us to unite the efforts under a single umbrella of um, EOTO or each one take one campaign. And together, we um, wanted to kind of highlight a couple of key areas. One was to build sustained um, momentum to achieve the 15 by 30 objective and beyond, facilitate and coordinate and amplify individual stakeholders, engage in various areas of higher education provision, scholarship, monitoring, student mobilization, skills, et cetera. Um, see more partnership, financial, and in-kind support for higher education institution, especially when it comes into refugee hosting countries, and also witness more refugee students accessing and thriving through higher education. I won't go into more details, but uh, if you're interested, we will share soon once the campaign is launched. But also we are hoping that this is toppled with a toolkit that provides stakeholders within higher education and skill institution with concrete and easy action. So if you're an academic, if you're a student, faculty member, on how do you get engaged, um, we share contact points and key resources to get meaningfully involved in the whole 15 by 30 target 
Um, so it's easier to um, follow a path based on the work that you're in. I'll stop here and hand it over to Alana. Thanks, Arash, and hi, everyone. My name is Alana. I work with Arash and Frankie on UNHCR's higher education team with a focus on data and evidence. The last opportunity to engage that we want to highlight today is what we're referring to as an opportunity mapping initiative, which is essentially an initiative to better identify and share information publicly on opportunities for refugees to access higher education in primary hosting countries. These may be scholarships specific to refugees or existing opportunities for refugees to be included in national education systems. The goal of this is to answer a couple of key questions where in some cases we do know a lot of information but are aware there are a lot of gaps. And this includes what are all of the key available opportunities for refugees to access higher education, thinking across those five pathways that Frankie described at the beginning of the presentation, to then inform our data collection on how many refugees are actually accessing and involved in higher education opportunities. And that's really critical for understanding progress towards 15% and beyond by 2030. And then both of these then will help to inform, of course, what investments and where are these needed to really increase higher education access for refugees. So this is an initiative that we're really excited to be kicking off this year. And the sort of key takeaways or why this is so important is not only to learn how existing programs can be made more inclusive of refugees, but really to strengthen advocacy, improve programs, and build the most accurate picture to date of what does refugees access to higher education really look like, and in the process, reducing information gaps on the part of students as well as institutions serving those students. So look out for opportunities to get involved with this. There'll be outreach, communication, asks for how to better collect this data, how this may apply to your context, what are some of the risks and incentives to report on this, and we're really excited to be kicking this off. And then with that, I believe we will wrap up the presentation from our side and I will hand things back over to Frankie and the team. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Alana, and thanks Arash as well. Um, I, I guess you can hear me, right? Yeah. Great. Um, so, Sylvia, maybe we'll hand it back to you, but before I do that, just to put it all into a nutshell, I think from our side at UNHCR, you know, just to, to summarize, higher education is a, is a huge priority uh, in our work in education because we really see the, the impact it has to transform the lives of refugees, um, but to, to, to achieve substantial change, uh, and have an impact in refugees' lives in higher education, we need to work with, with partners. And so uh, this is why the opportunity uh, to, to collaborate with the, the African Centers of Excellence um, is an opportunity that we see as, as really promising, as well as with the African Association of African Universities um, and the World Bank. Um, and so we're, we are eager to, to explore these avenues for engagement um, and to see what might unfold uh, through the discussions that we have. Um, so thank you so much again for hosting us. And with that, maybe I'll hand back to Sylvia. Um, thank you very much, Frankie, Priscilla, Arasha and Alana. Uh, we at this our next presentation presentations. Uh, we have some of our they are already so they are breaking if you could put some of these initiatives at the university of Fiji can you hear me now it's better now, Sylvia. Your voice was breaking in between. Maybe if it's helpful, you can disconnect the video. The video. Okay. Thank you. So I would like to uh, hand over the floor to Professor Banabas Icho. He's one of the center leaders in Nigeria, and he has also some experiences to share for hosting refugees uh, at his center. 
and also extending some of their uh, outreach activities to the G camps. So over to you, Prof. Barnabas, uh, for your presentation. Oh, thank you, Sylvia. Then thanks to everyone. I, I can I have the permission to share my screen, please. I am just trying to do that, and I'd like to appreciate um, the AAU for making this opportunity. Uh, we at the Center for Food Technology and Research have tried in the past to try and see anyone that can see what we are doing, and we were not able to. And I'm sitting here and I got a message to come and do what I've been trying to do for a long time. So I don't know if you can see my screen. Yes, we see your yes. screen. Yes, but maybe in presentation mode. Um, I'm trying to do that. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Prof. Okay, hello. Can you see my slides now? Yes, we can see your, your slides. We are good to go now. Yes, please. So I, I was saying thank you very much for the AAU for giving me this opportunity to talk about what we have been doing and uh, showing us some light that we may have um, some partners that we have been willing to and um, really, really wishing to talk to over the last eight years. So uh, Ses, we are from SEFTA. SEFTA is Center for Food Technology and Research at State University in Makodi in Nigeria. Uh, we we are a full-fledged state-funded university with 11 faculties and 47 departments. We are located in North Central Nigeria, and we have a, some borderland, the state where we are located has some border with Cameroon. So this is where we start building why we got involved into refugees. So if you see the round shape on the map, you will see Benue State there. It has borderline with Cameroon, and then... Uh, uh, Cross River, which has a longer border with uh, Cameroon and then Taraba State, all of them is in uh, on the border with Cameroon and Nigeria. So, and then we took opportunity of the fact that we got this uh, Africa Center of Excellence to address the problem. Our problem that we chose at the beginning of the Centers of Excellence was to try and bring solutions that would control post harvest food losses in West and Central Africa. So, we know that Cameroon also is part of Central Africa. And we were working around the area to solve a problem. And um, we chose this because in Africa, we have these issues that lead to food losses because of poor handling, poor handling techniques, and the poor transportation, the social cultural well-being of the people. And then we also discovered that even the crisis around the region lead to losses, either through header pharma crisis or other through some uh, human initiated disasters that will cause uh, farmlands or harvest to get damaged and so so we we got to be involved in trying to find solutions to this and um, as a result of that we also try to develop some intervention programs within the sub region to try and solve the existing pro problem so this is like one of our our, our, our products which we call the cassava value chain enhancement programs that uh, we had to go to communities to promote production of cassava, processing of cassava, and producing of products that will be consumed by target groups like children, women, pregnant women, and other pupils in primary schools, and so on and so forth. So we have a program that we run at the center, and these programs range from masters to PhDs in food-related areas, plus sociology, agricultural extension, curriculum and teaching. And recently, we are focusing on the promotion of African uh, indigenous foods. And um, we have partners in the UNDP. We worked, the World Bank was the main funding for the moment, the AFD, and we work with some meteorological agencies and the state uh, groups as well. Uh, are you hearing me? We can hear you now, Prof. We lost you okay. for some time. Yeah. We can hear you. Yeah, it seems like uh, he's not online. So maybe Prof. Madugu, um, you may take the floor uh, and start your presentation. We'll get back to Prof. Ichio uh, once uh, he gets better connectivity. So I really kindly assist uh, with rights to share the screen. Apologies to all participants. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, merci, 
Docteur Sylvia, merci à tout le monde. Et je m'appelle professeur euh, Madoubou Seydou. Euh, je suis le leader du centre euh, MS4 Mathématiques et Sciences pour l'Afrique subsaharienne. Euh, J'aimerais partager... Oh, I would like to share our experience with you on the training of Nigerian, Nigerian refugees that we are dealing with in our center, that's MS4. I would like to share with you uh, our presentation on the training, a practical training in a laboratory, that's a, a practical exercises with uh, the refugee teachers uh, from and Nigerian teachers in Niger. And so we will have a four point presentation, a brief partnership on the training of refugees, uh, the um, crucial achievements, what has worked well, and the challenges to overcome, as well as eventual recommendations. We have to say that we were solicited in the uh, context of uh, um, the a short training organized by ACR, UNHCR in Niger on the capacity building of uh, Nigerian uh, teacher refugees uh, in Difa at the eastern side of the country near Lake Chad. You have the map of Niger. And uh, these uh, um, uh, lecturers uh, or these teachers are uh, teaching the Nigerian refugees who have come to stay in Niger. And they teach the students of uh, Nigerian populations that are based in Niger uh, follow in following the Boko Haram phenomenon. To enable these uh, Nigerian students residing in Niger to follow their academic uh, uh, program for the end of the year, Niger created an examination center for these refugees uh, from Nigeria and also built in the area of DIFA institutions for these students. We'll have to say that this training has the objective of endowing these lecturers of students uh, the capacity to take care of the students in the practical exercises in the physics, chemistry, and the sciences, the health sciences, so as to pass the various examinations and uh, acceptable conditions and to also guarantee them a greater chance of uh, succeeding in their scientific studies. The success of these uh, young students will enable uh, uh, them uh, so as not to be found in terrorist, armed terrorist activities in their communities in the future. As uh, for the presentation of the partnership that we have had with the HCR and UNHCR in the context of this training, it's uh, UNHCR uh, took care of uh, the transportation and the fees uh, for uh, these refugees and then in the DIFA region, as well as uh, the transportation of our two trainers from Niamey to DIFA. That's 1,300 kilometers from Niamey. In the same way, UNHCR took care of uh, the uh, training of the participants as far as equipment is concerned, uh, and then as well as uh, the inputs of, for the contextualized training, that is uh, the teaching uh, materials that are contextualized for this training. Our center MS4 uh, took care of uh, the uh, stay of uh, the trainers in DEFA as well as uh, the coffee breaks and the lunch for practical training in the laboratories that is to uh, do uh, practical experiments in uh, the physics chemistry in the final year of uh, the high school and so in uh, teaching these uh, um, students for two years and so we gave them certificates of uh, training as well Something important that we have to say is that the Nigerian uh, Nigerian um, uh, trainees in the refugee camps, uh, we handed them in the different region. And also they are learning to uh, do uh, the experimentation of uh, practical exercises so as to be able to produce uh, in the final high school class uh, the same examinations 
and also to use conventional materials for them to carry out these experiments. We've also taught them uh, to use the uh, digital and uh, analogical uh, uh, tools. So that is for uh, current uh, uh, tensions, uh, um, that is uh, for electrical measuring of electrical tensions and the rest. And to be able to explain in detail for the students to be able to understand, since this is a, a scientific course for them to do both theory and practice. And moreover, these uh, refugee uh, teachers uh, were able to design uh, with uh, the training and teaching materials locally produced for them to undertake experiments where they don't need the conventional uh, apparatus. And also in physics, for instance, they had had to study everything that they have for the digital and uh, analogical um, measuring tools and also to measure the characteristics of the various uh, bulbs and the rest. On the reflections and the refractions, uh, photometry and disappearance of a uh, light, uh, and also the uh, polemic uh, mass of uh, bodies of the liquids and gases, and also for the Archimedes uh, experiments, and also to look at the uh, condensers, and also for chemistry, they did the electrolysis of uh, water, conditions of gas, uh, and uh, liquids and solids. Also for the preparation of the uh, acid, base acids uh, for their use, uh, and then uh, the colored indicators, uh, which are indeed part of the programs uh, that are indeed uh, taught at the final year. And also to look at the uh, what we could also do for the youth to see how they could also uh, manufacture local materials. De la vie et de la terre, l'expérience aussi. In biology and in the earth sciences, they look at what they could do with the air in a particular situation, and also experimenting on the um, the uh, food sciences at the local level and experiments on uh, reflexes, or uh, modular reflexes on uh, frogs because uh, in the area of the lake child and also experiments uh, with the microscopes uh, and uh, microorganisms uh, to be able to look at the uh, microorganisms uh, that we can uh, study uh, with the biology. And what enabled us uh, is to see how we could train these refugees uh, and also um, for how to use uh, these uh, uh, tools or or the equipment in the practical uh, exercises uh, in the physical sciences and the sciences of the earth, and also to do how they can install uh, these uh, instruments uh, for the work, and also to see how they themselves can uh, do uh, the installations for practical studies and be able to experiment, and also to initiate themselves uh, into the uh, design of uh, some contextualized materials by using the local materials, as we can see in the photos, but also to be able to interpret these results and to explain the results in the theories and to be able to see what accompanies the courses. And also from that, these uh, teachers uh, indeed uh, shared into the classes and they work up to the end of the year and they supervise the various uh, student candidates. And at the end of the year, with the scientific uh, uh, um, high school certificate, that is the SSCE in the Nigerian system, they had a 73.29% of a success. And that is highly appreciable for the refugee students that have left their country and are in another country uh, without their uh, relatives uh, who have integrated in the um, educational system and then they have this uh, rate of uh, success. This is the photo of the uh, uh, lecturer's uh, training using a microscope for experiments and to let the students watch in the various units on microorganisms. But also we have uh, uh, for them to be able to uh, carry out the experiments and also for the local experiments and also to show how they could uh, do these uh, serialized uh, accumulators or generators uh, 
to do experiments and to have uh, the results and to interpret them themselves. Uh, here also, we have a photo on a microscope so that they are trying to look at. And there it is the same photo, but uh, with the local materials that they are trying to experiment with so as to have a light and to test uh, resistance uh, in the bulbs. And here, this we have a biology experiment where they are trying to measure some parameter, parameters and the chemical parameters. Here, in terms of uh, challenges to overcome and the recommendations, it is mainly the difficulties uh, linked to the processes of uh, certain participants uh, in uh, this training. Because they were grouped uh, in the district headquarters of uh, DIFA, whereas they are in a refugee camp. So often it is not easy to uh, assemble them given the uh, context. Our experts went there for two weeks and they are judged to be useful that they need more time for the training so that the participants or these refugees could be well trained in the long term for them to have greater ownership. In terms of our recommendations, uh, it is to involve the other uh, teachers in the different region to intervene in organizing the examination for the end of the year so that they could benefit from the whole system because the secondary school uh, involves the whole class uh, from uh, uh, the, the first year of uh, the junior high to the last year and the first and year of the senior to high to interrupt. the next one now. Professor Modugo, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, you know, we haven't been able to see your slides. I think you are talking about the recommendations. So if you can maybe go to the recommendation slides and please show that to us. Yeah, that, that's excellent. Thank you so much. So I was saying that uh, we had organized several training sessions per year so as to be able to prepare these uh, teachers in organizing various uh, them for various exams of the year. So that's the group that has been trained, the Nigerian uh, refugees. And so I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Madugu. Uh, I have a presentation from uh, Prof. Madugu, uh, both in English and French, so we'll be sharing with all of you so you can also follow through. Uh, but I think it's nice to hear their experiences, how they coordinated uh, collaboratively with UNHCR uh, in a cost-sharing manner. They provided teachers, trainers to go and train the refugees from Nigeria at a certain camp, and then uh, with that cost sharing uh, approach, they were able to achieve a number of uh, results, including uh, the numbers that they had trained, the type of experiments and research that they have carried out, training of teachers in those re refugee camps. So the uh, the insights really are so exciting. So we'll be sharing the presentation. So I would like to pass over the floor again to Professor Ichio. Uh, for the interest of time, Prof, maybe uh, you will, will just pick up from where you left and um, yeah. share or highlight the key uh, lessons uh, that you'd like uh, the team to take home. Thank you. Okay, so I stopped here that because of the crisis. I'm sorry about that. Something went off on my end here. So because of the border we share with Cameroon, the crisis in southern Cameroon, between the Anglophone and Francophone side made a lot of influx of refugees to come into Nigeria. And uh, as at um, 2023, about 87,000 uh, refugees are estimated to come from uh, into Nigeria. In Benue, we have about 8,797 of them from the data I got from the offices around there, out of 4,900 are female. So uh, we have gone into T that whenever there are people coming like that, they will have issues about even getting food, the issues about self food safety, issues about nutrition safety, issues about health and safety. So we had conducted this assessment to determine what they would need. And uh, because of the courses which we have done for food handlers, food storage, where we train a lot of people, it's an example of some of our people we train within the country, we saw that the program was a good one. So we had to now take the program to the IDPs, first of all, to try and ensure that the little food they don't have is uh, is saved very well, the losses are reduced, and then they, they concentrate on nutrition-dense dense food, and then they also uh, know how to handle 
the food in a way that it's going to save for consumption, especially for children. So we carried out training starting from 2016. We went to the, uh, the Cameroon border. We saw that because if it is food poisoning, some of them were even into food farming and food processing. So we interacted with a lot of communities at different uh, sites between Benue State, between Cross River State and along the border. So we have trained a total of 480 uh, registered uh, refugees in their camps. And we issued them certificate for basic food hygiene and safety, issued them certificates on uh, food processing and packaging. So they could also find employment in some restaurants uh, within the border communities. And they can also process food, add some value to it to be able to sell it and even register some companies. So this is what we were doing uh in between from 2016 so we've done a couple of these and so, so most of this sometimes these refugees will be in communities sometimes they will be in camps so like this picture is one of the camps at uh, anyake refugee camp people in uncr will have these records because they will have even evidence to show that we went there um to do this offer this training and uh, we also take some palliatives to them when we go there so this is why we were interacting with this, because a high profile team from the centers would go there. Uh, in 2018, you can see I was part of the team as well. I deputy center leaders and all we were part of the team that went to the uh, out on the outreach program to see. And as a result, we also discovered that there were some people who needed to be trained for at masters and PhDs. So we now try to track them and offer them the courses that we have approved in the center. They applied and we gave them admissions. And then we continue to train them to in diverse needs because each year, each year we would find out, we'll find out what is the issue. And then we will, we will go on and give the training. So in 2021, we will give them not just basic food hygiene, or we'll have, because there was COVID, we went in to give them making of sanitation, uh, hand sanitizers. Uh, for COVID protection, then processing of plantain, because people in that axis uh, grow a lot of plantain. So we did them, we, we, we also offer training on food processing towards establishing businesses, uh, because we noticed that they lacked, uh, the, the economic power was low, the most of them lost everything in their country, and they came in to settle in this community, so they need something to do to earn a living. Majority of people in Nigeria at the border communities are farmers, so the, the food there is you no know, almost wasting. So we feel that if we train them on processing and value addition, they can make use of the as a business to be able to interfere. So we brought a group to our center in Nigeria and gave them a two weeks training on processing these things as a business. And this was actually in 2023. And we also introduced uh, a startup for them. So this group of persons, we purchase for them all the items they needed to be able to process all these items you see here, package them properly, and be able to sell it. What that means is that they are causing a lot of uh, effect in the value chain. They are also, they are growing the, the food, they are processing the food, they are protect, pro, protecting the food from getting wasted, and they are also making it hygienically to be stored and be used by children and women in the region. So that is a very big intervention that we saw. So going away from there and taking the most opportunity of these funding agencies at the moment, we have two major agencies, which is three major ones, the World Bank, the AFD, and the DAD from Germany. So we're able to give some of them scholarships to come and study for masters and PhDs. And we have so far been able to train about 39 of them from Cameroon out of these, 17 are male masters, 15, 17 are female masters graduates, and then we have five PhDs that we have studied in our center. Five of these, three of these are males, two of them are females. So we have also been able to offer support and monitor that some of them here are already establishing businesses. Like the picture I'm showing you here is one of our, our students, Evelyn, who is from the one of the refugees from Cameroon, who is going back to create an industry for food processing, packaging, and sell. And it's a business that he she has established for herself. We monitor. She's still on here doing the PhD with us, and uh, it's something that we monitor. We offer her training, we offer her support. And we ensure that uh, she takes these businesses 
for registration so that they are allowed for sale in both Nigeria and along the Cameroon Nigerian border. So we don't stop there because we also noticed that there are a lot of internally displaced persons within the country because of the farmer header crisis. So we looked at vulnerable populations like children and we took, uh, we identified that they needed nutrition, nutrient dense foods because they don't have a lot of their access to the food. So we took one of our products to them, which was the soya milk yogurt. And we were trying to tell them and the authorities to order this yogurt for the children. Right? So this was one of our outings that we, we took the yogurt from our factory because we have a spin-off factory that produces new um, um, uh, gluten-free uh, cassava-based biscuits and we produce yogurt for this. So this is one of our activities that we have there. But going forward, we have been able to achieve ser heavy, uh, serious capacity building to at both higher education, both masters and PhD, and then short-term courses build capacity in most of these refugees, 480 in total, 339 of them are females. And we have been able to bring about 18 of them together to form a group business. And they are now already doing business, processing food, selling, causing a big impact in the value chain. So we also notice things that work well is that all the, the refugees are ready to work and take on these courses. We also get a lot of support from the communities that host these uh, refugees and the agencies like UNHCR, those that are on ground, and the the Commission on Refugees in Nigeria and the state local offices, they give us a lot of support in doing this. Uh, most times we have problem controlling the numbers because we we plan for fifty. When we go there, we notice that people want to do up to one hundred, and then um, we also have a problem even getting the the for those who are coming to Nigeria. We have a problem getting them uh, documents uh, to come into the country to set up to study. Uh, we also try to have to get funding to process their documents to come in so that they'll be legitimate uh, students. So this is some of the pictures of the students who did MSc uh, in 2020. Uh, this is some a cross section of some of our students. Again, we have many students, not just the Cameroonians, some from Liberia. Now we have some from South Sudan that are also studying. But the one from South Sudan are not indexed as refugees anyway. They came in from the DAD funding this is when they graduated. So in summary, we have enough results to show that high level capacity building in young Africans has multiplier effect in, in, uh, in the entire food value chain. Even from refugees population that we've interacted with, we have seen that whatever we do, we've seen improved health conditions in the camps when we visit to check. We've seen that most of them learn from this and go into farming, go into processing to earn a living. We've seen that they are eager to study and add value to themselves at masters and PhDs and get into gainful employment. We have tested this model. We have a thorough training of these people. We know that it is working. Now the problem is the funding to expand this. We have been looking for an official link with UNHCR. We've written a couple of letters in the past, and some emails and made mention even to the AAU, and I'm happy that this has come. So we think that partnership that will sustain and expand on the academic support to refugees within this border region that has over 87,000 or more refugees around these communities and in refugee camps is going to be very, very useful. It's new to improve on what we are doing so that we can cater for more areas. Because we're a center for food technology and research, our courses are around food and value addition in the food industry. But we have capacity as a university to expand this in down to even undergraduate level, to offer the teaching support, to offer scholarships to these uh, refugees that can come into study. Our, cent our program have got international accreditation. We can work on a model in partnership in any of the options that were presented earlier on. Uh, we, we also have issues about trying to organize a safe return and resettlement of these refugees. Because when they come here, most of them don't want to go. They came here, some of them came with their wife. They have to live in a student hostel. We some even had children. We have to look for a way to make them uh, have a safe stay and study. So in all, all we need is that we have, we have been working in this and we should be able to partner more, get more funding to expand on what we are doing so far. And uh, I wanted to just show you, a, before I go, a short video of uh, how this is just even an internet display out outing that we had on uh, basic food hygiene, nutrient-dense food with the children. Oh, oh.
Let me see. I have to. Yes. So that was just to show you that was an outing to just educate them and tell them the kind of food that they can give children that even though they don't have enough, it's nutrient dense. It will be able to keep them very well nourished and improve on their upbringing and health, healthiness of the children. So I want to thank you very much for this opportunity. We are here. We have expertise in the last eight to 10 years. We have been working in this area on our own with our own models and trying to impact in the system, not just on the food in the food value chain, but on the people. And when you talk about the people, whether you are a refugee or you are internally displaced, you are part of the people. And that the, uh, the, uh, the coming of the World Bank project has actually helped us to see the need to go beyond the confines of the university to impact beyond just the university or state or country, but across the Western Central Africa region. I hope to do more. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Icho, uh, for your great insights. And the pictures could really tell the story uh, of what's happening and what you have done intervening in this um, capacity building uh, needs for the refugees. I think it's 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 um it, the presentation I think was very informative as well as what we have received from Professor yeah. Maduko. So we have now a comprehensive understanding of the needs, the demand from the UNHCR perspective what is required and what are the pillars they are looking for in, in this kind of uh, intervention. And now the centers have also come in to provide uh, what they have tested, piloted, and what has worked well and where the challenges and the gaps are. So at this point, I would like to open up uh, the floor for uh, questions. Uh, of course, we are running out of time, but we can give maybe few minutes, five minutes to pick up questions, uh, if there are questions to UNHCR, questions to the centers, but I think uh, they should be just helping us to align uh, to the next steps that we would like to see after this webinar. So any questions for those with uh, questions can raise their hands, but also we have a chat box. Uh, so far, there are no questions on the chat, but in case there are some questions you'd like to pose uh, to our presenters, uh, we, we can pick that. Questions, comments, suggestions from the perspectives received so far? Okay, can I ask a question? Yes, please, Prof. Go ahead. Okay. I, I believe that at the level of the AAU and World Bank, there may have been discussions on the... Uh, how we could go on to partner and uh, improve on this already. I believe that is what is going on. And this meeting is part of uh, the expectation, uh, part of the, 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 the steps towards this. So what I want to know is that, what is the plan? Uh, thank you so much, Prof, uh, for that. So I think from Abidjan, we just made an announcement that uh, we are exploring the partnership with UNHCR, and uh, with that, we will be getting in touch with the centers on uh, our next steps. So part of the webinar today is to just provide the overview, the perspectives, and of course, we've not gone into detail uh, on how we are going to uh, partner, but I think the insights that we are getting from these presentations and everything will be part and parcel on the uh, next steps that will be communicating to you. But of, of course, uh, since the UNHCR team are also here, the World Bank is here, uh, they can also uh, share with us uh, some of the uh, potential uh, way, next steps. So Ekwa, Namrata, Frank, I don't know if you're available uh, to, uh, to share some of the next steps uh, insights. Thank you, Prof. Thanks, Sylvia. I'll see if maybe Frankie or Priscilla want to uh, come in to say something specific, but otherwise I can um, share sort of some, some at least uh, general thoughts about um, 
how how centers can consider this information provided by the UNHCR moving forward, and also what formal collaboration with the UNHCR, um, you know, would could look like in the future. I see there's also another hand up, so maybe if we want to collect a couple of questions, we can also do that. Okay, so um, Gerard, you have the floor. Uh, merci. Merci uh, pour la parole. Thank you for giving me the floor. My question goes to Arashi Afriki that I've talked about uh, the training of uh, refugees uh, in uh, higher education. Mainly, I am from a university of uh, two IE based in Burkina Faso and funded by 16 countries of the Sub-Saharan Africa, and mainly to achieve objectives 15, uh, 20 by Arash Frankie. We have a, a, a scholarship that we offer to the refugees. But now the difficulties that we have, as they've talked about it, is that there is a difficulty, not only, to have these refugees, uh, but also to integrate them uh, in higher education. So I would like to know what are the mechanisms that they put in place uh, to, or the uh, advice they can give us or to see what uh, we can do and how to integrate them into higher education. Thank you. Frankie, um, jump in if um, you would like to add as well, but maybe just very briefly, thanks, Gerard, for the question. Um, of course, it's very interesting. There are many different ways, um, and we work with many partners that provide different support in making sure that in addition to supporting refugees getting into higher education, they also have enough support to access the resources that exist um, to be able to work with other students through student clubs to have access to training opportunities, um, advocacy, leadership, and etc. So what we might be able to do, Gerard, is to connect you with some of our partners. And I think Frankie mentioned as well that there are bridging programs um, which complement um, the study, the student, the student studies that they will have in uh, bachelor degrees or masters. And but we can discuss this a little bit um, later. I think if you put in your information, uh, we would be able to reach out and maybe provide more information. But over to you, Frankie. Yeah, thanks, Arash. Just to add to that very briefly, um, that um, there's there's not like a single blueprint that we can say this is the way to do it. I think we can, the, you know, what we can do is draw together examples of best practice. And I think particularly, as Arash mentioned on the bridging program, we have got some research conducted by the University of Edinburgh alongside the refugee law project in Uganda, which really looked at how to use bridging programs to integrate refugees um, into universities. Uh, if you wanna hear more about that, I've put my email in the chat and I'm happy to share it. Uh, we also, also later in this year should be doing these workshops, which is more focused on digital, digital higher education, but it will have components on into integration so i think looking at kind of we've got some research we've got workshops we can also put you in touch with, with partners who've been really looking at this question so i think there's a lot of question connections that that we can draw on um in order to try and help that um and just to say I, i'll talk very very briefly because i can see three hands raised just the, the, the initial question which namrata alluded to around what's next i would just echo the point that sylvia made you know, for me, this is listening to the two case studies. It's so promising, you know, the potential for partnership here and to do more. Um, but I guess to say we're still at early, early days, right? I mean, from the UNHCR side, we're, we're just starting to learn about the centers of excellence and what's the potential there to meet refugees populations. And, and I think um, from your side, you know, this is the first time we've presented on the higher education work for refugees of UNHCR. So I think we need to have a few more conversations to dig in the details before we get really specific about the next steps. But I think from our side, uh, there's a lot of um, enthusiasm and encouragement from this call about what, what could happen next. 
Uh, but Sylvia, I'll hand back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Franz. Uh, we have two other hands. Uh, one from Maimuna. Uh, do you do take the floor? And then uh, after you, take the other question. Okay. Merci pour la parole et merci aux différents présentateurs. Thank you for giving me the floor and thank you to the various presenters. My question goes to the presentation of uh, Professor Madugu and uh, to Professor Barnabas. It seemed to me that in the presentation, it is true that uh, they had essentially, for the case of uh, Nigeria, they had been uh, short-term courses. There have been some PhDs too. I want to know how the recruitment is done because uh, when we talk about uh, higher education, that is uh, at that level. I hope it's uh, like the uh, higher institution of a uh, 2IE and I am in charge of uh, social safeguards. And I want to know how the recruitment is done for the university, knowing that Professor Madugo uh, laid emphasis mainly on their intervention with uh, the uh, fin uh, final year class of the high school. It is true that they are refugees. You brought um, teachers from Nigeria to take care of them. How are they integrated into higher education? And how is their educational path uh, done? And what is the, uh, the average age of these uh, students? From uh, what class uh, do you intervene with them? What is the average age when they started? Thank you. Okay, so can I go first? This is Barnabas. Yes, yes Prof. Okay, so uh, for for us, we started from identifying the need for uh, what we can intervene in the food value chain within the communities hosting the refugees or within the refugee camps. And then we also identified that some of them are actually uh, graduates of universities in Cameroon. And then we give them normal recruitment for masters and PhDs. That is a standard in the university. So they have the qualification. They even are able to process transcript. The only thing that is difficult to get is the, the papers, the travel papers, because of the, the crisis situation. Some of them couldn't go to Yaoundé. So we have to work with our immigration in the country to help them process the SEPAC or the, the, the documents for them to be uh, um, students from Cameroon. We have not been able to process the asylum because we it's not within our own jurisdiction but we give them admission according to our university standard and international. Most of our programs have international accreditation and we the procedure for admission is the same. Only those who are qualified. And that is why we just have a number of uh, 34 for masters and five for PhDs. Uh, thank you. Can I uh, continue? Hello? Yes, Hello? please, Prof. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, thank you to Madam Maimuna for her two questions. We'll have to say that for our center, the training that we've uh, given is a short-term training. It is not permanent training. It is a short-term training for the Nigerian refugees that are living in uh, Niger. I mean, there are 250,000 refugees in uh, Nigeria living in the area of Gifa, around uh, Lake Chad, where there's Boko Haram. Among these refugees, not only they have relatives, uh, but there are students uh, that are attending the secondary schools, uh, that is uh, colleges uh, and high schools. There are also teachers of the secondary, because in the whole area of Maiduguri, around the border of Niger, around the Lake Chad, uh, which was destabilized, uh, they were obliged to get into Niger. Among this uh, population, uh, UNHCR and the government of, uh, Niger, of uh, Niger decided uh, to create uh, secondary educational institutions for their children to be able to continue their education, which was interrupted in Nigeria. And since they are with uh, teachers, 
these teachers will have to be trained. So our center trained these teachers in the use of the materials for practical experiments in the laboratories so that they can undergo their courses. So we didn't do uh, initial training for these students. But now, as I said, that uh, they've done the baccalaureate or, or the uh, A-level, once they get this, they're going to join universities without problems because they have the same level as uh, other ordinary students. Now, the average age, we have to say that for the students of the second grade, the average age is between 18 years and 22, 23 years. But we trained their teachers, not the students themselves. We acted on the uh, trainers of these students. And so the trainers are adults. It is a matter of capacity building. We said it was a short-term training because after the evaluation, we realized that these teachers had some gaps in uh, teaching the uh, physical sciences and then the earth sciences, where there are gaps. So it was the gaps that we had to fill. And then this gap, the rate of uh, success, success for this, for the UNSCR, these uh, students, uh, as they succeed, they will uh, be saved in uh, uh, from entering the terrorist armies, but also they could integrate into the community. And so this is a, a high value uh, contribution if we are able to save all these students and then to help them to uh, integrate the university curriculum. This is how I can answer on the questions that you've asked. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank so we'll you. be taking up the last questions. Uh, given that the time is running out. So uh, we'll pick one from Professor Ibrahim, and then the last will come from uh, uh, Professor Joktan. And then thereafter, we'll hand over the floor to the World Bank and UNHCR for our next steps. Thank you. So over to you, Prof. Ibrahim and Prof. Joktan, in that okay. order. Thank you. Thank you, and I think uh, I've been a very stimulating presentation from the two of that have been about. I have just uh, a clarification. How, in some cases, it's very clear to the time who are refugees. Because it, to, uh, how do we really, uh, differentiate genuine refugees from those who are opportunities using just those clarification to see uh, uh, such opportunities? Two, we have, particularly in Nigeria, a lot of internally displaced persons. Do they qualify as refugees within their own country? And how this project takes those, those that into consideration? That's just my question. And then, yeah, I think I need to be, uh, uh, um, well, well a nice answer to be able to guide us. Because in, some, in, in our own situation as a center, we are more involved in the, in, uh, in infectious diseases, particularly in tropical uh, diseases. And there are cases who can actually conduct uh, short-term trainings, especially because in most refugee camps, you have issue of uh, out disease outbreaks. So we'll be very much interested in to keep in, but I think we need some of this clarification, uh, clarification before we can really know what to do and how we can actually keep in into the project. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Ibrahim. Uh, Prof. Joktan, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you uh, so much for the opportunity to listen to this uh, interesting uh, conversation on the um, education for those in okay is it better yes it's better uh so maybe you can just summarize the question and uh we missed part of okay, the it's, the it's it's okay it's not really a, a question and that sl has but it was because of the nature of uh open and distance learning we operate issues of connectivity issues of devices 
and the cost implication. So I'm really looking for uh, the next steps such that we will also be able to key into this and be able to include the displaced uh, persons into our digital education platform. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, input. Um, I see one last one. Of course, we are running out of time. Uh, Professor Samba Sira, if you can just uh, share your Wait. question in one in less than a minute, so we we conclude. Thank you. Oui, merci beaucoup. Merci de m'avoir donné cette opportunité et toutes mes félicitations. Thank you for having given me this opportunity, and my whole congratulations to those who, who are presented. I wanted to know because they have worked with the refugees of the UNHCR. It is, is it there? Did you go to the UNHCR to ask them for the availability of this? Or it is the UNHCR that made the order for you to be able to provide this training? That's just a question I want to ask and or to know. Was it an order from the UNHCR to you or you approached the UNSCR to propose this to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Icho, uh, could you kindly respond? How did you reach out to the refugees? How, okay. how I, I know you had highlighted at the beginning of your presentation, but you can just quickly yeah. respond to that. Yeah, so we have a, a emergency, an agency for the internally displaced persons. We have a refugee commission in Nigeria. We have uh, refugee camps on the borderline, and uh, we work with farmers and food handlers. So we have worked with people. So we identified those hotspots, and we went there on our own. So those who were working at that point, either in the camps or within the communities, supported that we could offer that training. So uh, that is that. We didn't contact the UNHCR office initially. We tried to contact them to, to, to support what we were doing, but we were not successful initially. And then the other question about knowing refugees, uh, we have all the refugees that we work with have the, the identity card or passport of the country. So we were able to know that they are real refugees. They are from this Southern Cameroon. And uh, we, we already know the crisis that is there. So we don't know, need anyone to tell us. We know that there's a problem within Southern Cameroon. We already have thousands of refugees within. So we only look for those who are qualified to be enrolled into our master's and PhD program in the courses that have got accreditation within our university on the project of the ACE project and the ACE impact project. But we're only thinking that it could be expanded to cover undergraduates or other programs. Because a lot of youths between 18 and 24 uh, within these camps, we where they are not yet up to postgraduate education. So, but we can't go down there because our project at the moment uh, limits us to focus on higher education, which is master's and PhD, or short courses, which are just more certificate courses that are for anybody who can read and write. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Banabas Icho. So I think we have responded to all the questions and the um, comments that came through. Maybe for oh. Professor, yes, oh, please. Yeah. Yes, so for I, Professor I, I, Ibrahim. Yes, I have a question on the status of internally displaced refugees. The status of? Internally displaced. Yes. In, okay, the status of uh, internally displaced refugees. Maybe I can just say something very okay. quickly on that. Thank um, you, Frank. So, yeah, obviously, um, I, I would say, you know, like, let's, it's probably best to, to not just think about refugee inclusion in the programs, but also, especially where these programs take place within a refugee community, that they're inclusive of not just those who are refugees or who have been forcibly displaced, um, but also the host community. Because I think by drawing a strict boundary around one group and purely targeting that group, it's um, it can be pro you know it can raise some tension within the community or between groups. Um, and to say as well, I think a lot of our partners when they open these programs, they don't speak about refugees. 
they will use terminology such as uh, forcibly displaced and stateless. So it's inclusive of, of not just refugees, but also those who have been internally displaced, who haven't crossed an international border. Um, but also, I think, and, and it speaks to your other point about how to be sure they are refugees or genuine. I, I think it's really important to make sure the host community are, are included in these programs as well, um, so that they're fully inclusive. Over. Thank you Hello. so much, Frank. Yes, uh, Professor Marugu. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Pour répondre à la question de du collègue uh, Sila. Eh, en fait, uh, nous, comme nous sommes une institution de référence pour la formation. As we are an institution of reference uh, for a training of uh, the secondary teachers, the UNHCR that comes to us, uh, that came to us and asked whether we could take care of uh, these. Uh, teachers that are training students at a secondary level. So it was uh, the ACR that approached us, but also to add up to the last intervention on making a difference between the refugees and the others. We should say that in our case, uh, we uh, benefited from uh, training the refugees and uh, the other teachers uh, on uh, the uh, Nigerians. We didn't make any difference in order to frustrate the other that are there. We asked the region if they had uh, teachers who needed or uh, this capacity building to join them to the refugees uh, or the refugees uh, teachers so as to be able to train them. And this is to show that the last contribution, what is said is exact. When we are doing our interventions, we don't differentiate uh, so as not to frustrate the people in that area. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, Prof. Madugu. I think we have now responded to all the questions that we uh, we received. So at this point, I think it would be nice to hear from the World Bank and um, UNHCR on closing, taking us to the next steps or what would be our immediate um, expectations uh, after the webinar. So I would like to hand over the floor to Dr. Ekwa Bentiu and Dr. Namrata, and then we will give the floor again to the UNH, uh, NHCR colleagues uh, to also provide uh, their closing words. So thank you very much. And Dr. Ekwa, you have the floor. Go ahead, Namrata. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you were connected. Ekwa, come in. No. So um, I think this has been interesting. Thanks, everyone. And um. I've been in and out of the meeting, um, but I think this has been good. Uh, I, I heard some of the questions about how to connect, you know, what's the next steps here. And I, I know at the back of the minds of the centers, you're thinking about funding, right? So, um, and, and that's something that on our site we've been looking at and it's as Frankie said, and Namrata indicated is early stages, right? Um, and so, um, we are looking at what can be done now. Are there centers that can, you know, take on some of these um, refugees with your current funding? Um, it's good that, for example, SEFTA shared they had, I think, DAD, right, uh, funding there, which is excellent. So are there other avenues that right now you can tap into for your current, um, the current fund that you have? Um, we do know that within the bank, we have, a, a refugee window in terms of funding. That's something that would have to be explored as part of the next iteration of ACE, um, but not uh, right away. And we're also speaking to other partners as well, but um, we know funding can be, you know, a, a concern. And um, Prof. Joktan mentioned about, uh, since they are an open university, it's all online and how you know, providing devices to the refugees to really connect to their programs and um, Wi-Fi or whatever it is, the connectivity aspects and, and how to support them. So there's a lot of things that we'll have to think of, but I think this is a very good start um, for us to, to build on. Namracha, you may add over. No, I think this is this is exactly, you know, as Equa summarized, I think since these are early stages, part of the agenda for today's interaction was to to become a little more concrete with who are the partners, who can be ex uh, approached, 
uh, what are uh, the various possibilities and and it's clear that there are many and there's more discussions that that need to be had as as everybody is saying um and yeah and 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 then just to be sort of uh, you know completely uh, open about uh, the funding as part of the current ace impact project as you know um there there isn't a specific uh, refugee window or additional support to expand these programs uh, but going forward we are not only speaking with UNHCR but but uh, other partners to see what can be uh, done but i i think that even bilateral connections with some of the partners that were mentioned in the UNHCR presentation um, would be very good information for centers to have. And we would be happy in whatever way that the project can and AAU can to help further facilitate these partnerships um, uh, with these other organizations. Um, so just in, in closing, I would also, you know, just like to thank a big thank you to Professor Barnabas, Professor Madhubu, all the questions that came in, uh, all the center leaders and other center representatives that are here today, Frank, Kiara, Shalana, Priscilla, and then of course, uh, Sylvia and the rest of the AAU team for the fantastic coordination and just organization of this uh, interaction session today. So thank you so much from my side and uh, over to our UNHCR friends in case there are any last words from you. No, just to echo your thanks, Namrata, to everybody who was involved in this call and, and who participated. Um, just something from our side, you know, like uh, that could be uh, in the short term is for those, you know, this is the first time that we're hearing about this great work that's been going on in in Nigeria, in, in Niger, and I know Professor Barnabas mentioned, you know, he wanted to, to share this more widely. We do have these coordination mechanisms. Um, so we can we can invite you to those where you can connect with partners globally, universities globally working on refugee inclusion, you know, to 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 make those connections to build that community of practice with other institutions. So our emails are all in the chat, so please reach out to us on that. Um, as well as, um, you know, we're looking at, it's really great that the example of the cost sharing model came up. I think that's something we're eager to explore. I think currently we haven't got um, anywhere on, on our, in our sites in West Africa on the cost sharing model. Um, but we'd be really keen to, to kind of look into those discussions as a kind of shorter term uh, solution. Um, uh, you know, like uh, as we work towards something more longer term when it comes to funding. So that's also something we'd we'd be eager to explore. Um, so again, our contacts are in the in the um, in the chat, and we're happy to to take any of these discussions forward bilaterally with any of the institutions on this call. Uh, but once again, thanks very much, and Sylvia, back to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Frankie uh, Namrata Equa. Uh, for all those words. And I think for now, we've come to the end of the webinar, but as indicated, uh, for the next steps, we'll be reaching out to you in various ways. And uh, we have all the contacts uh, from the registration link. So we'll be sharing uh, all the information that will come through. So once again, thank you very much and we wish you a wonderful day till we meet again in the next webinar. Okay, thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Thanks all.